Hey, this is Supernova. I'm still making my way through How Do We Know the Bible is True, Volume 1, and I'm giving you an atheist perspective on this and rebuttals to the Christian arguments being made in this book. Today we're on to Chapter 4, Did the Physical Resurrection of Christ Really Happen? It's kind of a long chapter and I have a lot to say about it, but I can talk fast and I'm going to try to sum everything up I can as quickly as possible. It's written by Tommy Mitchell, who is a former doctor, an actual medical doctor for 20 years, and he left that practice to work as an apologist for Answers in Genesis. Is kind of tragic, I think. But anyway, he's a smart guy. Let's see what he has to say on this subject. Now, first, uh, he wants to establish why we would care about this thing. And we atheists don't care. I, it doesn't prove that Jesus is God. I already made a video on this, how it would be a non sequitur to try to link these two events. And it doesn't prove that the Bible is true just because this one part would be true if it were true. But still, he believes that it... Uh, proves Jesus is God because Romans chapter 1 verse 4 says so. I mean, I guess you have to presuppose that the Bible is true in order to uh, get that point, but, you know, Christians do. So he mentions that. And one of the reasons why it doesn't make any sense for uh, a resurrection to prove that somebody is God is because there were lots of resurrections. We have many stories of people who are brought back from the dead by various prophets and by Jesus, and none of them are considered gods. But this guy kind of makes a uh, distinction between the two. He calls them recitations when somebody is brought back from the dead by somebody else's power. And he says, Jesus rose himself from the dead. And because this is supernatural, we can't look at the mechanism between the two things and say, oh, well, we can definitely say that uh, Jesus brought Lazarus back from the dead. All we have is a correlation. Jesus says, come back from the dead. And then he does. And we just assume that somehow his words made it happen. So we can't, we can't compare that to Jesus rising from the dead and say, oh, well, Jesus definitely did it under his own power. But he, again, goes to the scripture to try to prove this, and he cites John 10, 18. Now, I didn't know this verse, and it seemed kind of suspicious because Jesus doesn't die until John chapter 20, and this is 10 chapters before that. Why would it describe how Jesus came back from the dead? And of course it doesn't. Jesus is giving a speech, and he says that nobody else has the power to take his life, which is kind of weird because we don't have any account of him committing suicide but then he says and he has the power to give it back to himself which means yes he could raise himself from the dead according to his own words if you take his word for it but it doesn't say that he would or that he did just because he could doesn't mean that he necessarily did but still who cares it's, it's just scripture um let's see it it uh also supposedly proves that he saved uh, the human race from sin. And again, that's something you can only get from the Bible. There's no way to link salvation or uh, freedom from sin to the resurrection. You just have to take God's word for it or the, the words of the writers in the Bible. And uh, so this is this is just background, not that important to us. But then he gets to the meat of it. How do we know that Christ rose from the dead? He says we must rely upon eyewitness testimony. Now this is really interesting to me because we don't have eyewitness testimony. We've never spoken to any of the eyewitnesses. We haven't even read what the eyewitnesses told us. Because if you haven't noticed, if you've seen the the accounts in the Bible, they're they tell stories of women visiting the tomb, not the writers of the Bible. They didn't witness the resurrection. Now, I, I hear this so often that we should believe things that are in the Gospels because the Gospel writers were eyewitnesses. That's why it's so important to the Christian that Matthew actually wrote the book of Matthew and Luke wrote the book of Luke, even though it's very likely that they didn't. And, and I don't understand why they make this argument. It's very clear to see that they're written, writing things that aren't by eyewitness accounts just because of the contents of the book. For instance, we have Jesus with the adulteress, and after he says he was without sin cast for a stone, he writes in the sand, and everybody walks away, and it says specifically, till only Jesus and the adulteress are left, where he tells her, go and sin no more. 
who told the author that that was the line? He didn't witness it. We have the story of Jesus alone with Nicodemus at night. Nobody else around. We have the story of Jesus being tempted in the desert by Satan. Again, there are no eyewitnesses to this account. And even if you believe that Jesus might have passed this on to the disciples who are taking it down, consider the uh, events at the beginning of Matthew and Luke that tell the birth narrative of Jesus. Jesus didn't see the the events that happened before he was born. They're they're not written by eyewitnesses. They're not even hearsay that the disciples got from other people. It's it's not eyewitness accounts. Now, of course, I've told this to Christians and gotten their response. Well, the the gospels are God inspired. They're God breathed. God told them what to write. And that's fine. Thank you for rebutting your own argument with less than a minute's thought. It's so easy to rebut this argument because it's stupid. Yes, if you believe that God inspired the writing, you don't need an eyewitness. Who cares if the book of Matthew is written by Joe Schmo, if he's just a middleman who is taking dictation from God? Because he's not drawing the events from memory. He's drawing them from what he's being literally told. I don't understand why Christians try so hard to make this impression on us that we should believe it because they're eyewitness accounts. They're not, especially the resurrection. The disciples weren't there, not even according to the story. But anyway, let's go on. We, we have uh, a section called historical sources, which I found kind of interesting because there are a few actual historical sources that uh, not tell about the resurrection, but they talk about the death of Jesus and the existence of Jesus. But the author here wants to list the Gospels as historical sources because they are sources and they're in history and because he's a Christian and so he, he believes them. Now it, it says, uh, the skeptic often objects to the use of Bible as a source of information claiming that the Bible is full of errors or contradictions. However, in these cases, the burden of proof for these alleged errors falls on the skeptic because this author doesn't understand the burden of proof. When you're making a positive claim, you have to be the one to present your case. He, he doesn't believe in the Quran. I'm quite certain that Dr. Tommy Mitchell here does not believe in the Quran simply because he has been unable to disprove it. And even if he did, even if he attempted the same way that we skeptics do, you know that Muslims are going to come up with rationalizations and other reasons why. No, you haven't disproven our, our book, obviously, because there are still billions of Muslims around just as there are billions of Christians. They rationalize the contradictions. You do, they do. You're, you're never going to be able to prove something that the believers have put in the realm of uh, undisprovable, that they keep coming up with excuses that push it away from things that you can test and, and know and actually verify. So, no, the burden of proof isn't on us because then you would have to believe every claim made by everybody that you couldn't disprove. And you don't. And we don't. So, he, he claims that we should believe the Bible not just because the, the burden of of proof is on the skeptic, but the reliability of the Bible as a historical document has been demonstrated over and over. Historians and archaeologists continually affirm the accuracy in the Bibles in matters of history, and they often also disprove them through archaeology and pointing out contradictions and such. It's just the author's confirmation bias, along with that of many Christians. They just don't spot the errors. They won't accept the errors, even when they're blatant. And the the resurrection stories are such good examples of contradictions because there are four of them. Now, when uh, somebody on Easter morning has heard a sermon, I like to ask them, could you tell me the Easter story? And when they relate to it, I can guess what gospel is from because I'm fully aware of all four accounts and they don't line up. There's there's a different number of women visiting the tomb. There's a different number of angels. There, there are a different order of events. Like Matthew has the earthquake and the rolling away of the stone, and the angel sitting on the stone, things that aren't found in the other Gospels. And John, we have disciples visiting the tomb, which isn't mentioned in the other Gospels. And we have Mary seeing Jesus at the tomb and 
it, it contradicts the other Gospels. They don't tell the same story. And it's, it shouldn't be possible to guess which Gospel the story is in if they're all telling the same story. But, uh, of course, I can because they don't. All right, I'm, I'm going way too far off track. I'm trying to get through this very quickly. Did Christ really die, he asks. Uh, we don't really care. Now, he's, he's going through the gospel account to verify whether Christ really died. And, I, I mean, if we're granting that, yes, I believe the, the Bible says that Christ died. Case closed. Now, could we see some sources outside of the Bible? He, he tells of the things that happened to Jesus. He went through a crucifixion, and naturally that should kill him because that was the purpose of a crucifixion. Crucifixions did kill people. And so if we believe that Jesus suffered through one, then yes, he would probably die. Now, some people have uh, proposed something called the swoon theory, which is to say that they believe that Jesus didn't die, that the guards merely thought he died and he counters this by saying well the guards were experts at killing they did this for a living they they ought to know whether Jesus was dead but hang up for just a moment here we don't always know what death looks like even in our modern age uh, consider in 2007 there was uh, a case in Venezuela of a man named uh, Carlos Camejo who was in a serious car accident and declared dead at the scene he woke up during his own autopsy in 2007 they didn't know whether this man was dead to the point where where they were clearly doing something that should have killed him and he still came to life and you say, well, that's in a foreign country, and that's a whole seven years ago. Well, consider in 2011, in Los Angeles, we have a Spanish woman named uh, Maria, Maria de Jesus Arroyo, who was an 80-year-old woman, and they believe that she died of cardiac arrest. But obviously she didn't because she woke up in the morgue, in a box, and of course she was pounding and screaming and trying to get out because she wasn't dead. We don't have a clear idea of what death looks like, especially 2,000 years ago. It's not that much of a stretch to say that they might have declared somebody dead who wasn't. But nevertheless, it's it's improbable even if it's possible, and, and who really cares? The, the Bible claims that he was dead, and this is the only source of the, the story anyway, so I would just accept that. The Empty Tomb. It says the empty tomb is crucial to the claim that Christ rose physically, but uh, there's a major problem with this in that we, we pretty much have only the Gospels to go by for the empty tomb. Because even though this seems like the sort of thing that ought to be able to be verified later on, it, it seems that the tomb was lost to antiquity. People didn't know where it was. There was such a thing as tomb veneration where people would worship at a tomb and they would consider it like a holy monument. And tomb veneration of Jesus' tomb didn't happen until like two to three hundred years after his alleged death. And so uh, it seems that people just didn't know where his tomb was. So there was there was nobody to check whether there was an empty tomb. We have stories in the... Gospels that say that the tomb was empty, that the women arrived and found an empty tomb, and that's really all we have to verify. And of course, that's that's what he uh, goes on to state. Now he answers a, a skeptic objection uh, that some people say, well, maybe the disciples stole their body, and I've I've heard this one before, and I've only heard it from Christians. I don't know if skeptics ever actually make this. Uh, argument and he he claims that immediately after the crucifixion crucifixion we find the disciples fearful and cowering and this always seems to be argument against it that the disciples were cowardly and they wouldn't take on the alleged guards that were around the the tomb which are by the way only mentioned in Matthew we don't have mentioned guards elsewhere and this seems kind of strange to me because in the actual resurrection account it was just women going to this tomb. They didn't bring some army of their own. Uh, as far as we know, the women were 
fearful and cowering too, but they were willing to take on these guards, apparently, because they did. Now, this seems to me like reading the story, I'd say it was plot convenience. You know, in a movie where you have something that, that shouldn't happen because the, the characters don't have foresight, but everything just kind of lucks out for them anyway. And we, we might jokingly say, well, that's because they read the script. And that seems to be the only reason why it works. We have a case of that in the, the crucifixion accounts where the women, first of all, go to a tomb that supposedly has a bunch of guards around it. And they don't have any way to get through the guards or around the guards. And yet uh, we just have an account where all the guards fall as dead men. So, hey, convenient, they got through. We also have uh, them in Mark mentioning that they didn't bring anything to roll away the stone with. And that's kind of important because you would think if they had ever done this any time before ever, they would have already known that they had to move the stone and they'd have to bring some men with them or something, some sort of tools to move the stone. And Mark even claims that they didn't have anything that they were talking about hey we ought to have something and they just conveniently show up and find the stone already rolled away or in Matthew they see it rolled away and uh, again why should we believe this account because it doesn't make sense except in the, the context that they read the script they already knew it was going to happen so uh, in the case of the guards I don't understand why we should think that the women were prepared to deal with them somehow and the disciples weren't. But nonetheless, who cares if the disciples really stole the body? We, we have no reason to believe that the body was missing except just because it says so in the Bible. We have eyewitnesses of the disciples and women. And of course, they're kind of conflated here. They're not going to point out the fact that the people who wrote the documents, people we, we read from, aren't the actual witnesses. They're just hearsay telling what others might have told them they saw themselves. And uh, of course, the Bible says that plenty of people witnessed them. We have story after story here of different people who supposedly uh, witnessed it. But there's no reason to take their word for it because none of them wrote accounts of what they saw. All, all, the only thing we have are disciples saying that other people witnessed it. Now, we, we, at the very end of this section, we have uh, another argument that I've commonly heard from Christians that we know that the disciples witnessed the resurrection because they were willing to die for their belief. And most of us especially after 9-11 and such, we know that Muslims are willing to die for their belief. Many religious fanatics are willing to die for their belief. And he, he of course, brings up the subjection. It could be argued that many people have been willing to die for a cause. So the change in the disciples in itself is not proof for the resurrection. Further, the objection is raised that fanatics of all type have been willing to die for their particular beliefs, of course, but the real issue is not whether the person willing to die believes their faith to be true, but whether they know it is true or false. Now, we don't have any idea of, of whether uh, a religious fanatic believes or knows that their faith is true or false. To me, these sound like just expressions of somebody's confidence. And generally, if you ask a religious fanatic how sure they are of their belief, especially if they're about to die, they will claim to know. The author doesn't know if they know or not, but we can pretty much assume that they believe that they know. And it, it just, it doesn't matter. There's no, there's no real distinction. He's trying to make a, a false dilemma between the two. But we, we know it's, it's all the same from an objective perspective. But anyway, in chapter one of this book, we have an argument against this. There was the argument that the, the Bible is true through personal experience by people changing after, uh, witnessing something or or getting this new belief and he said people change their uh way of life for all kinds of things most religious conversions in include a big change that doesn't mean that they're based on truth but this guy didn't get the memo because he not only goes on to say that the witnesses of the disciples are true because of their big change then he there's a section here called the witness of paul 
in which he makes the same argument. Saul was uh, a guy who stoned Christians for a living, and then after his conversion to the Apostle Paul, he did a complete 180. So that must mean that his belief is true. No, it, it doesn't, because people have life changes for many reasons. We have the witness of James. Again, he's making the exact same argument that James, the brother of Jesus, went from just being a minor character to somebody who went out and preached like Paul. But again, a life change doesn't mean that it's built on a true event. We have the writings of Josephus, finally an actual historical uh, document, which many of us doubt uh, for good reason. Uh, I'll just list a few of the reasons. That I'm not going to go through what Josephus actually says, but it seems rather religious for somebody who wasn't a Christian. Uh, it, it, these aren't the, the words of somebody that we would expect to be a skeptic of Christianity. It's a rather short section compared to the other things that he writes about, especially if he's expressing such a belief in this. It's kind of weird that he only writes a paragraph. It's written out of context. There's... There's writings about tragedies before and after, and this isn't a tragedy. It's a rather weird place for it. And also, we, we know that Josephus' writings were in the hands of the early Christians for many years, so we believe that it's a forgery that they inserted it themselves and just claimed that it was from Josephus. But anyway, even if Josephus wrote that it happened or not, again, it's it's hearsay. He wasn't a, wit he wasn't a witness at all. He's just a historian. He has some credibility but not a witness. And then uh, a real physical resurrection, the author asks, was it just a spiritual resurrection or a bodily resurrection? He goes through parts in the scripture that claim that it was a bodily resurrection, and uh, who cares? I'm, I'm willing to grant that the, the Bible says that it was a bodily resurrection. And uh, he, he presents some skeptics arguments that I, I can't imagine any skeptic has ever actually met suggesting that the disciples had a hallucination uh, I mean you, you grant too much truth to the scriptures to even get that far uh, I, I'm not even going to go through it skip don't care all right why is a resurrection important this is the the last thing that he asks and uh, uh, again, he says that it's important to Christians, that uh, Christians simply can't be Christians without the resurrection. And I, I think this is rather interesting, what he says in the last paragraph. Put simply, without the physical resurrection of the Lord Jesus, there is no Christianity. Now, I remember back in the, the uh, chapter about the reliability of the Old Testament, we were told that there's a theme that starts in the Old Testament that goes on to the New Testament. It's the theme of Christianity, the theme of Jesus crushing Satan. In the Old Testament times, before Jesus was born, there was no physical resurrection of the Lord Jesus. So was there no Christianity? And in the next sentence, he says, as Paul said, if Christ is not written, then our faith is futile. Was the faith of the Jews futile? What we have here is uh, a very common thing that we have with Christians examining the Bible. And that's hindsight bias. They can't put themselves in the perspective of people in another time. But seriously, uh, even before, even while Jesus was living, there was no physical resurrection of Jesus. He, he existed, but he, he hadn't lived. And yet, we are told that there were believers back then. But according to his argument here, there shouldn't have been. There shouldn't have been people believing that Jesus was the Messiah because the resurrection of Christ is just that important. Without it, there's no hope. But anyway, that's, that's this chapter, and I'm so proud of myself for getting through it in less than half an hour. Uh, I like the next chapter, too. Uh, it's it's very poorly put together, but it's still an interesting topic on uh, whether Genesis came from ancient myths. I hope that you enjoyed this video. Uh, feel free to comment below, share, subscribe. 
uh, you know the drill. And uh, I hope I catch you for the next one. Peace out.